And we are live? At least I think we are live. I think I heard Demetrius saying three, two, one from his office, but not in the Zoom call. Anyway, we are live. Welcome. We have a very special interview today with a very special guest. I would like to introduce you to you, the Hugo Award winner, John Joseph Adams. John, how are you doing? Uh, I'm well. Thanks for having me on. It is such a pleasure. We've been having such fun nerding out, chatting <laughs> All things world building, writing, D&D before the call. And guys, there is more of the same coming today. Let me introduce you to John properly because he is, of course, far too modest to introduce himself. John Joseph Adams has been everywhere and done everything, is the TLDR. He's the series editor of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy and more than 30 anthologies such as Wastelands and The Living Dead. He's also an editor and publisher of the Hugo Award winning magazine Lightspeed and for five years was the editor of the John Joseph Adams books novel imprint for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and lately he's joined the dark side. He's been working hmm. as an editor on TTRPG products for Cobot Press and Monty Cook and contributing game designer on books such as the Tome of Heroes from our very fine friends over at Cobalt Press. So what's winning right now? Game design, <laughs> uh, game writing, or, or traditional writing? Where where do your loyalties lie right now <laughs> on, on the sliding scale of love? Yeah, I mean, the love part is way more towards TTRPGs, uh, just because like that's what I probably rather do all the time. <laughs> but uh, the, but the, the practical side is like, well, I got to I got to make a living. So I still got to do this traditional public. I mean, I still love it all, you know, but uh, it's just that, uh, you know, that's where my heart is leaning these days is toward. It's up last with dice, guys. You heard yes. it here first. Well, of course, we will be talking today about rivers and waterways because we're running a challenge about that right now with Cobalt Press. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking about this later as well. <gasps> what was it? We'll tell you later. Uh, <laughs> but first going to start a little raffle now john has very kindly donated a book to the raffle lost worlds and mythological kingdoms tell us a little bit about this john uh well uh it's kind of what it says on the tin uh, lost worlds and mythological kingdoms so uh it has uh stories about uh places like atlantis or like shangri-la these sort of legendary places that you've heard legends of well i guess that's you know Legendary places you've heard legends of. Yes, that's how it works. Uh, so, you know, and then like, uh, you know, people who discover them uh, and uh, and the adventures they have therein. Um, and uh, and then the Lost Worlds thing is also like where, you know, you have uh, a place that you didn't even know existed. There was no legends of it. You just kind of stumble upon this like hidden nook in the world that previously was undiscovered and, and it's uh, full of dinosaurs yeah it yeah it has to be full of dinosaurs yeah often often dinosaurs yeah um and so uh so yeah that's that's what the stories are about um some of them actually take place in space even so like they find the authors found ways to make lost worlds uh fit in that context too so i thought that was uh, pretty fun but um yeah i mean it's it was a really fun book to put together um and uh the edition from grim oak press uh is just beautiful it's like uh it's got a you know, just wonderful cover. Um, and it's got uh, really high like production values. It's like done like sort of like limited edition kind of feel to it. Um, so uh, yeah, it's really, it's really great. Uh, and yeah, that, ju that just came out recently. So that's the most recent thing uh, Very I had exciting. out. So uh, my favorite line was explore the rich tradition be uh, begun centuries ago with this all new compilation full of imagination and delights. Mm -hmm. What lies beneath the edge of the unknown? Mm -hmm. Only you, brave reader, can <laughs> find out. I love it. I'm so excited mm. about it. And I get to give it away, guys. Mm. I'm just about to start that raffle now. And uh, if you follow the link in the little Streamlabs pop-up, then you will be able to go and check out the book and read more. But before you do that, make sure you stay with us because we are talking rivers and waterways. Mm -hmm. Let's kick off with the big one. Big open question here. How can we use rivers in our storytelling? What roles can they take in our stories and what themes can they embody? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, one of the really cool things about uh, different uh, elements like that in, in world building is that you can attach all kinds of mythological or fantastical uh, sort of things to it. Uh, so like, for instance, you know, one commonly known thing is that like, you know, vampires can't cross like uh, running water, that kind of thing. But, you know, there's you could make anything 
to do with something like that. You can make any kind of creature that has trouble crossing water, or maybe uh, it's it's weaker on one side of a river than the other side, or you know, or anything like that. Um, and and so I think it could be really interesting to to use rivers in that context. Um, but then also there's there's different uh, kind of races that might live in rivers or or live in other kinds of uh, uh, you know waterways. Uh, are we also including like oceans and stuff? Is that is that part of waterways yeah, or is that waterways? Okay. So okay. a waterway is defined as any, and I checked this. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> of course, when I put the challenge together, yeah. as any navigable stretch of water. Ah, okay, cool. So that's why I was like, let's mm -hmm. get the like people element into this challenge with right. with that word. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, with uh, with uh, when they have oceans involved, it's like there's all kinds of uh, cool things you could do with that in a fantasy context. You could have, uh, you know, like living waves or, uh, you know, um, you know, all kinds of fun sea creatures that live down, down, down in the deep, uh, you know, that uh, no one uh, even has ever seen before and that kind of thing. So, um, I mean, I think there's all kind of fun stuff you could do with that. Um, but then also like you can incorporate it into like fantasy industry and like, you know, you could have rivers that, uh, you know, flow up waterfalls instead of down waterfalls, all kinds of stuff like that. I mean, it's like just, I feel like as this thing that we just know because it's in our real world and they're everywhere, uh, I think it's a fun thing to be able to just take that and twist it in ways that are obviously, well, they're impossible in the real world, but it's fun to think about and, uh, you know, gives you that little extra uh, sort of bit of flavor to world building that, you know, it, it's like an easy way to get some of that extra flavor, you know, where it's like, maybe it's, maybe you're not going to really do anything with it, but, you know, hey, the river, the waterfall goes up, it, it flows up. That's cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Absolutely. I can imagine a D and D session like the player. You you just throwing that in there, and the players just get obsessed with it. They're like, I gotta figure out why does that waterfall flow up? It must be important. They wouldn't have put it in there if it wasn't important. Yeah. You know. I love that. I love that. I also love that you jump right on that fantasy space because I think oh, yeah. you know rivers are are so amazing for so many reasons. Like, um, in my opinion, they're great for sort of showing the health mm -hmm. of a of a settlement. For example, like if the river is gray and murky and full of crap mm, i'm looking mm -hmm. at new london then that's hmm. a really easy way to say okay this place is polluted this is probably a darker setting it's a more dystopian place or or it's more grim dark or you know i've i've set mood immediately by doing that but if the river runs smooth and crystal mm -hmm. clear and reflects the waters with a prism of sunlight then all of a sudden you've got a completely different place mm -hmm. and they're so often at the center of settlements that, mm -hmm. because of course that's what the settlement was built around that it then becomes this real centerpiece of your mood and theme as well mm. yeah and and i think one of the things you could also do is um you can use the contrast of like so for instance if you have like a shadowy realm that you're that you're in uh if you have if you have your your characters uh encounter this pristine clear river then that's a really like sort of stark thing for them and you know uh like a sort of a, a more wondrous thing it's like if you're in this like really uh you know dark and polluted seeming place when you come across that thing that's like oh this is pure and and you know like so that's nice when when you can have uh, uh sort of things like that happen uh in a story or in a, in a game session or something um but uh but yeah i mean i think uh you know there's um there's all kinds of uh, interesting things that you can do when you, uh, you know, sort of imagine new context for whatever world building element. So like, um, you know, e you know, I was talking about like, you know, rivers flowing up a waterfall, but like, you know, you don't have to stop there. You can also, you could have, you could have rivers going through the air if you want. I mean, you know, it's a fantasy world. You can make anything you want happen. Uh, maybe some wizard did something weird back in the day and it made this river, you know, sort of go up into the sky, you know, and, uh, um, or, or maybe there's like one of those floating cities that like, you know, the, the, you know, the land mass is floating in the air and then they have a, a waterfall that comes all the way down and, you know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe water maybe a, a riverway connects two floating cities and and people sail across between them you know i don't you know there's just all kind of fun stuff you could do with it yeah absolutely <clears throat> so um what do you think are the most interesting ways people use rivers and waterways in world building hmm like, do you, uh, yeah. I mean, you work across so many genres, right? Yeah, different yeah. Media types and right. novels and short stories and RPGs. Mm -hmm. So what are the, some of the most memorable examples that you've seen in fiction? Yeah. 
Uh, I mean, I think the most memorable things are like when uh, people create like whole new societies uh, that live in water, like in different ways. Um, and I mean, um, so it's it's kind of a universally uh, reviled movie, but like I always like I always felt like Waterworld was really an interesting example of world building, like. I don't know that it really would hold up if you like picked it apart or whatever, but uh, just the like the, the the settlements that like you know grew up into in this world that had become completely flooded, like that was all really interesting to me, and that's like a uh, uh, an interesting thing to look at if you're trying to build worlds where it's like even if that was not an, a, a successful example of um, of, a, of an actual just overall movie uh, to most people, uh, you know, you can take lessons from it from the things that it does do well. Um, so uh, and I mean, I think that's universally true too. like in any kind of world building context where, you know, uh, you know, it, you can you can use you can use uh, uh, stuff that you don't like as fuel to help you build something that you do like because it's like um, like one one famous example is uh, outside of rivers and waterways but like uh, people who have there have been so many people who have written uh, things that are like Star Trek done right you know because it's like oh they were they were upset about something about the way star trek did whatever and so then okay now they take it to their own hands to do it the right way um you know quote unquote and uh and so but you can do that with anything you, you know you can do it with fantasy worlds i'm sure plenty of people have done it with like you know like oh uh terry brooks uh, i i didn't didn't love sword of Shannara or whatever so i'm gonna go do my own thing i mean he kind of did that with tolkien except well i guess he kind of just rewrote tolkien but anyway um so yeah, but I mean, you, that's, you know, find inspiration where you can, I guess. But... Yeah, absolutely. One of the things <laughs> I loved about Waterworld, and I, I love that you bring up that example, is that mm -hmm. we often associate, and that's another question, but we often mm -hmm. associate water with, you know, life and the cradle mm -hmm. of civilization and all of these things. And in Water Waterworld, that whole theme was flipped on its head. It was like, mm -hmm. the water is is all around us but if you just if you're just in the sea for too long it will kill you mm -hmm. so i thought that was really interesting where it it took this concept of you know this this thing that is full of life and flipped it and turned it into something that was was very dark in a way mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um i think uh that's another thing you know when we're talking about themes that's really significant i once had this amazing interview with umberto eco and he was saying that um Someone was saying, oh, why Why is this city full of fog? You write about the fog mm -hmm. all the time. Why did you do that? Is mm -hmm. it because you wanted to make it feel creepy? Is it because you wanted to make it feel like this? And he said, no, it's because the fog feels very comforting to me. It feels <laughs> like a cocoon. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to create. And I think that's something really interesting with rivers and waterways as well. So my association with water is, oh, it's it's terribly cold and horrible. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm from the UK, right? So water mm -hmm. is just like gray, murky thing that mm -hmm. starts where the land stops. and. <laughs> um, it's terribly cold and and like you don't want to go in it and mm -hmm. and now i live in greece where you know the water is glistening blue and everybody wants to be by the sea all the time mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean it's uh i i think there's uh there's all kinds of ways to uh um you know explore fears and stuff as well with that because it's like in terms of i just started thinking about that because you were saying like how well like on the one hand you know there's people who like just really want to be near the water all the time but there's also people who just never want to be near the water because either they had some bad experience with it or just they're they're just afraid of you know even attempting to go in there be, maybe they're claustrophobic or whatever but um you know uh I mean, I myself don't particularly care for like oceans or rivers or waterways. I don't, I don't want to be in a river or waterway. I get, I get seasick if I'm on a boat. I don't want to be in the water by my, you know, like, you know, so like, uh, but, but so maybe that's naturally why I'm thinking about like fears and stuff. But like, I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, cool, like really weird alien type creatures to us, like even in the real world, like if you go down into the sea. Um, and so like when you then extend that to fantasy worlds, it's like, okay, well, there's all kinds of great stuff. And I mean, even if you just look in the, like the D&D monster manual or whatever, it's like, there's so many cool underwater monsters. Um, and uh, so, yeah, and and yeah, I'm actually, I'm in a, a, a Ghost of Salt Marsh uh, game right now. So like, obviously a lot of that is uh, all water-based, you know, like we're basically pirates and then we're fighting Salgan and uh, going in <clears throat> under, we're underwater a lot of the time. So, um, but uh, yeah, but it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Um, and 
I, I think it's interesting from uh, from a like a a D and D perspective uh, or you know role playing game perspective because it's like it, it when you put it when you put the players into such a completely different context as underwater <clears throat> with all these additional rules and everything that have to be applied because you're underwater uh, it, it makes it for a really interesting uh, sort of uh, dynamic um, like because it's like it's put it's putting you into this different situation that like you know okay well you're you're really uh uh able when you're on land and you're comfortable and you're and you're used to what you're you know you're fighting in this context you're used to and then when you throw people into water it's like okay well now it's a completely different game and you're fighting something that lives in water you know so um you know it's uh i think that's fun of yeah, course I'm, I'm playing a moon druid so i just turn into something that can fight you know live in water <laughs> so i did um i did a promotional game for the the D, &D channel with uh, Ghost of Saltmarsh. Mm -hmm. And um, the GM that we had, Guy the Great GM, for those in the know, um, created his own homebrew races because he wanted to add a little bit of his own spin and show mm -hmm. sort of the breadth of the setting that's that's possible, not just what's mm -hmm. written. Um, and so we all played aquatic races that were mm -hmm. largely homebrewed. And we mm -hmm. had exactly the same problem in reverse. What mm -hmm. do you do if you're a mermaid and you're on land? Mm -hmm. Now, I was lobbying for a battle wheelbarrow and I did not get one, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great shame. It was going to have, mm -hmm. I was going to be like Boudicca with one wheel. Huh. Uh, it's going to be amazing. But apparently that was not, that was not the thing. So I ended up with a magical object and that was a quick way to solve that problem. But it does, if you do have mm -hmm. aquatic species, it does bring up really interesting questions. Mm -hmm. How does this work? What changes do people make? Because essentially they have, a disability when they are mm -hmm. out of their element and that is mm -hmm. a really interesting thing to explore yeah yeah and in, in our game we have uh we have a, a sea elf and a triton and so like we have a fair number of people who are you know aquatic but um one of the things that i thought has been interesting that's come up is like okay well when we start talking about like books and things and it's like oh wait so wait do you, do you all have books down there you know like and it's like well how, how do they have books i mean how do they how do they learn all the things that like this guy knows or whatever you know and so um is it all oral storytelling and uh you know because i mean they can talk to each other underwater but can they have books i i don't know i mean it, it is a magical world so sure i guess but uh it's just like how does that work exactly it's one of those uh it's one of those gaps in world building that like if you drill into it too much like in like the way D, &D has it presented or with it, the way the module has it presented it's like well, I don't know. Let's just move on. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's it can lead to what I like to call world builders disease, which is yeah. where you just end up obsessing over small things that are not really taking you forward and adding you to the plot. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I vote kelp books that disintegrate <laughs> water. Oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I, I think limitations make for really interesting stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can I say? Yeah. So we actually have a question that's coming from Dalsen Cat, which is very interesting. What are the most essential parts of a waterway that every waterway must have? Oh, um, hmm. Well, I'm afraid I don't have enough like like scientific knowledge to really answer that question. Like, uh, I I've been amused on Reddit, like uh, seeing people talking about maps and like the rivers on maps. And there was this whole like river gate thing where it was like, oh, like the rivers are going the wrong way or whatever. And like, I was trying to follow it. And I really was trying to understand what they were talking about. And I just never really did understand it. So uh, I'm not the right person to ask about that particular thing. Like if you got something wrong in, about how a waterway flows or something in a, like a novel or, or a, an adventure or something, I, I I have to admit, I probably would not notice. Um, so that's that's not the sort of editor that I am, where I'm going to catch that kind of thing. But um, you know, uh, ideally, I would be, I would, I would uh, be able to like Google around or like find find some some something about the way it's presented. Like, is that how it works? Let me go check. And but as far as being able to advise off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I mean, so. It's interesting because I presented a lot of these kind of like all the cartographers say um, mm -hmm. the mono mountain is another one. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. have a single mountain in a plane. Oh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, or, or rivers that split. Rivers should never mm -hmm. split. Mm -hmm. They should only join, according to the cartographers. But mm -hmm. I asked my sister, who is a geologist, and she mm -hmm. said, rivers split. Mm -hmm. Here are five examples. You mm -hmm. can have a mono mountain. Often they're extinct volcanoes. So mm -hmm. I think it's very it's very good to be careful of what the cartographers yeah. say because in general they may be right, but there are also a lot of really interesting 
mm -hmm. examples where, in fact, this weird, cool thing does happen, mm -hmm. and yeah. this weird, cool thing can happen in your world. Mm -hmm. So that's always my answer to those things. Like, make yeah. it make it work for your story. Yeah. And honestly, that would be how I answer that question. The thing mm -hmm. that the essential part of the waterway must have is it must serve the purpose that it's supposed to be serving in your story. Right. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, too, it's like, uh, you know, uh, if you are writing in a fantasy world, it's like, it doesn't matter if, if rivers don't split in the real world or not, you know, because if you want them to split in a fantasy world, go ahead, you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the rivers should just, or whatever way should just do what you needed to do in the story. And, um, you know, and then I think, you know, just, just have to be consistent with it. And uh, once you, once you establish the parameters for what it, how it behaves and 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 all that like it, it you stay consistent unless there's some sort of external force causing it to do something else like magic or whatever so um yeah i think that's that's the only thing um uh and yeah just like you know i think it should have a purpose like you know don't just have a waterway because you feel like you know like uh like oh well it, every town should have a waterway it's like well i mean should it in this case like not everyone does so like you know it, it, if it is essential to your town then yeah put it in there but don't feel like it has to be there just because a lot of towns do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, I would say, we say waterway, but it doesn't even have to have water. If mm -hmm. your people can navigate lava flows, mm -hmm. build lava flows, it's awesome. Why, mm -hmm. why on earth not? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if that works in your world, if that's something, if that's a story you want to tell or a D and D game you want to play, mm -hmm. then do it. Give everybody rubber boots and mm -hmm. asbestos boots, maybe asbestos mm -hmm. boots. Give everybody asbestos boots. <laughs> so um, any favorite real world examples of cool rivers or waterways? Uh, I mean, New Orleans is basically like a ridiculous uh, fantasy map. If you look at it, I, I, I don't know if you guys had seen uh, uh, James Sutter, who's one of the um, you know creators of Pathfinder. He he like did a whole Twitter thread, uh, <laughs> like looking at New Orleans as a map and thinking like if if this was a fantasy map like it, it would never fly like people would be like wait wait what like there's this giant bridge that goes across this enormous lake that's ridiculous and uh and then just like just the, all the geography of it um so i mean yeah new orleans stands out as like okay well <laughs> i mean that's amazing that 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 actually exists um but uh but yeah that's that's what comes to mind for me I love that. I played a vampire game in New Orleans, in oh. New Orleans and we did indeed spend a lot of time at the map going, this place is awesome and, yeah, really yeah. and awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then biting people because it was a vampire <laughs> game and that's what right. you do. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. Um, how do you handle water-based travel, like sailing, for example, either in stories or in RPGs? How can mm -hmm. you make it interesting how can mm -hmm. you manage that sort of downtime space mm -hmm. uh yeah i mean and uh, i mean i guess it's going to be pretty different in storytelling versus role-playing game just because like in storytelling you can you can just skip ahead if, if if there's long stretches of boredom or whatever but um but i mean there's lots of uh complications that can happen so i mean i think you know you know you can have them encounter other ships you can have them encounter uh bad weather you know you, they can, you know, uh, have uh, mutinies on board. You can have um, them run out of supplies. I mean, because it's like, because because it's so restricted in terms of like what's available to them. And so like any kind of um, loss is like really uh, felt like sort of tenfold, like compared to like, you know, if you just lost something from in your house, you know, it's like you can go get something else, but they're stuck on the sea for however many, you know, more months or whatever. Um, so there's that, um, but and then in role playing games, obviously there's there's going to be you know rules in in your game for how long it takes to get from point A to point B when you're on 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 a boat or whatever. But um, again, it's like you know I think the fun part of of that in a role playing game is to you know well don't just put your people on a ship have some kind of aquatic monster attack this ship and you know they have to defend it and because then again that's a that's a different situation that uh, you know even if you're not jumping in the water and fighting it on its own turf like you know you have to fight a monster from the ship or you have to repel invaders and, and that kind of thing and i think that's fun um it also gives you the opportunity to like bust out some spells that you don't necessarily normally use like like control water or like tidal wave or something and like you know just like really mess with uh these ocean dwelling uh, creatures uh, day you know um but uh yeah i mean i think um otherwise uh you know i i 
I, I think you just skip over any boring parts, you know, I mean, even even in a role playing game, it's like, you know, you don't have to account for every second of every day. And it's like, uh, if it if it's uh, just like two days of, of travel where nothing happens, it's like, okay, well, now we're back in town, <laughs> you know, nothing happened. Uh, you have a long rest, you have two long rests, you know, do, did, did anybody want to do anything in, in the in the intervening time? No? Okay, we're back in town, you know, so uh, yeah, I think you just lead whatever, um, you know, is boring just and so i guess that's that's it's the same actually for both uh fiction and, and role-playing games in that case yeah. just the role-playing game no story gives you more and there's roles. no conflict yeah yeah on. yeah 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 we got a great question that came in from marquis de Degue, uh, i think uh who asks what are your what are your favorite or some interesting methods for moving goods and items along waterways hmm hmm um uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything uh, that comes to mind that's like too, uh, you know, unique or anything. But I mean, it's like, you know, boats and barges and things. But um, I mean, again, this is somewhere where you can let your imagination run wild. And like, you know, uh, maybe you you have maybe there's a whole like sort of uh, breed of like sort of livestock that that just sort of swims up and down like riverways, um, like, you know, maybe like something like a like a like a manatee or like or like something bigger than that like you know that you can uh strap stuff to and i mean like they just swim up and down a place or whatever so i mean like you know i don't know there's things like that um but uh and then of course you know you have in a, in a world where there's magic you could have magic uh or um as uh you know uh you have a magical industry and everything like you know you have artificers and that kind of thing you could you know they could have built magical contraptions that can go up and down the rivers um maybe they're powered maybe they're powered by hydroelectric power or something you know and so um i don't know i mean there's there's all kind of things but um in terms of like actually thinking of examples i can't really think of anything offhand that uh, comes to mind um but yeah i mean i think it's a good idea good thing to think about because uh, it could, you know, th that's a, that sounds like another fun way to add some, you know, flavor to your to your world building. Uh, so. um, I would like to add an interesting little anecdote. Mm -hmm. So Shakespeare built the Globe Theatre. Um, there was some legal hanky panky about the land that the theatre was built on. So in the dead of night, they dismantled mm -hmm. the theatre mm -hmm. and they took it across the river. It was it was frozen the river at the time, mm -hmm. and they literally they broke the theater apart, carried it across the river in the middle of the night mm -hmm. on a balls freezing freezing time, and uh, reconstructed the theater on the other side of the river. Mm -hmm. So um, these are the kinds of stories and legends that you can create. Mm -hmm. You know, and, mm -hmm. and rivers change state. If a river gets really clogged during the mm -hmm. Um, during a period where of autumn, for example, where all the trees are deciduous, if a winter, if a river swells its banks or becomes very, very small at certain mm -hmm. parts of year, or if a river freezes over, you will get different kinds of transport and different kinds of ways of using the river if the river changes, if it's seasonal. So I think that's something not to not to forget as well when we're thinking about the way people use rivers is mm -hmm. that rivers are, of course, not static but not even their beds are static mm -hmm. like and not even the volume of water that comes through is static so this is something that you can really play with a lot like oh in, the, in this period of time we do this and in that period of time we treat it like this mm -hmm. uh, and i think there's also uh opportunities for um so, sort of tension when you use rivers as sort of like a, a, an impediment where like you know okay well if the river is particularly deep or wide you know uh you can have you know, sort of bandits corner uh, characters so that, you know, they use the terrain to sort of, uh, it, you know, s set up an ambush or something. Um, or or there's cases like in, um, like in Wheel of Time when they're, um, when they're fleeing from the Trollocs in the, in the first book and uh, Moraine uh, sort of leads them across that uh, river or lake. I'm not sure what it was, but it was, it was some, you know, it was a, a, a a sort of moderate sized body of water that had a barge and, you know, they had to, uh, you know the trollocs like vampires i was mentioning i guess don't want to cross running water um and so uh so yeah that's uh, that's another example of where like you you know you can work the the existence of of this waterway into a into a setting in a way that uh you know sort of adds into the tension and the conflict that's happening 
I love that. I love that so much. And I think rivers have so much potential for that. Um, also, the way they use geopolitical boundaries or mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. there's this amazing uh, incident that happened during a hurricane where the whole river went bloop, <laughs> and moved. So now mm. there is a bridge in South America somewhere mm -hmm. next to a river mm. because mm. the whole riverbed moved. Now, mm -hmm. if that river happened to be a geopolitical border, what the hell do you do then? Mm -hmm. Hmm. It's so interesting. Or if somebody yeah. upriver stops the water flowing down. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like you can really use it um, tactically to like, yeah. cut people off downstream, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting idea in terms of uh, things that you can do like in a fantasy setting comp in particular, because when you have magic and all kinds of, uh, you know, crazy impossible things that would, or things that would be impossible in the real world, like, yeah, you could just have like some evil tyrant just cut off that riverway uh and so it's like oh everybody south of here well too bad for you i know you survive on that river but you i guess you better uh uh you know yeah. pay me my due or whatever <laughs> you know because i'm evil uh, I love but that. yeah i can just say it as like a nice river there shame yeah. if someone were to gather yeah, yeah. 30 mages and turn it into a lake <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah no totally and and there's so much like rivers give dyn dynamism to the landscape like there's so mm -hmm. much that you can you can do with them that's sort of interesting and tactical. That's why we ran the challenge in the first place. I'm obsessed mm -hmm, with rivers. Mm -hmm. I think they're really cool. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> let's ask one final question from the chat before we move on to our second topic of the evening. This to this question is any tips for world building river piracy? I am obsessed mm -hmm. with river pirates. I keep talking mm -hmm. about them. We did a whole video about how cool rivers are. Mm -hmm. I would shout about river pirates. So John, what's your opinion on river pirates and making them awesome? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it just seems like they're already awesome. I mean, just uh, is I mean, is there anything in particular you need to do besides just make river pirates be there? Like, I mean, that sounds awesome. Um, you know, uh, uh, actually, uh, so uh, I, I guess it's probably in the module, but like when I played uh, Princes of the Apocalypse, uh, there was a there was a case where there was sort of river pirates, and it was like, and it was it was very memorable. I have to say, it was my first encounter with river pirates in D and D. I think, but um, but yeah, that. Uh, um, Thinking about having that like as a as just like a a constant thing that's all up and down rivers that actually sounds really awesome, um, and uh, I mean I guess it depends. Uh, you know you have to have uh, rivers of a certain width and depth and everything so that it can accommodate these things without and like you know you have to because you know pirates have to be able to like ambush you like you know they can't just like be, you can't see them all the time and then like uh, so I guess I don't know maybe maybe you have maybe you have some invisible sea uh, river pirates or you have uh, river pirates that are uh, you know under the they they they're mostly under the water and they they emerge uh, to to do their piracy uh, so I mean I don't know I guess that's that those are a couple ways you can can make it even more awesome than they just inherently are but uh. just river pirates just being yeah. awesome yeah. I think yeah like you say little tributaries are another useful thing mm -hmm. for that because it's places that you can lurk mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. on, and good bends and this kind of thing mm -hmm. like again if if I'm thinking like a DM if I'm mm -hmm. thinking about you know half cover and advantage to hiding and sneaking mm -hmm. and this kind of things that's the kind of things I'd be thinking about I think mm -hmm. Uh, and there's also like things like uh, like fog and um, and other kind of uh, things that like you know might provide cover you know ambush spots and that, that that kind of thing. So, I mean, if you wanted to, you could even go so far as to give them. I mean, you know, like harbor chains that protect oh, yeah. the harbor. Yeah, yeah, they can yeah. like erect chains on either side of the river. Like, yeah. a, you can go quite far with this if you wanted to. I right. would say the most important thing with your river pirates: give them a purpose, mm -hmm. make them want something, mm -hmm. preferably something slightly more awesome than your stuff yeah uh, like give them give them a, a dream or a motivation or a cult or something mm -hmm, cool mm -hmm. that that gives them that like something extra than just like i covered things that don't belong to me right right uh yeah and there's also like uh river pirates could even potentially not be actual like uh pirates who have a ship that are on the river like they could be they could be land-based and like they could converge on from both sides uh on ships and maybe they have magic that can like you know like siphon this the wind out of the sails to, of whatever ship is on the river and uh you know yeah, uh, yeah, or, make or it dead in the water or... yeah, yeah absolutely oh i love that i love that river pirates <laughs> there you are so I think it's time to go on to the second part of today's interview, which is about professional writing. Now, John, you have mm. done just about every single part of the traditional mm. publishing space, haven't you? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been doing it since uh, 2001. And so, you know, it's been a long time. Hard to, hard to believe. I'm so old now. 
<laughs> nonsense, nonsense. <laughs> Don't say things all like that. You'll upset us all. Um, <laughs> So obviously you are a giant in the publishing industry. I would be remiss if I didn't ask about the traditional publishing world. Mm -hmm. Now, I know a lot of our authors are interested in, in indie publishing, but a lot are interested mm -hmm. or are curious about mm -hmm. traditional publishing. So my first question is, if our authors were interested in publishing short stories, mm -hmm. for example, in collections like the mm -hmm. ones that, that you turn out, like the Amazing mm -hmm. Lost Worlds collection, what should they do? How should they approach that dream? Right. Uh, well, I mean, I think, you know, uh... Uh, just first of all, uh, you should only. I, th I think you should pursue writing short stories if you actually like short stories and like write, writing them. Um, like sometimes people think like, oh well, I should. I sh I want to write novels, but I should start off with writing short stories just because it's like a smaller project that I can do, and then I can you know maybe get some publications and stuff, and that'll make it easier for me to sell a novel later. Some of that's true, but. I feel like some people get into this mindset that they just need to do that as a stepping stone, but you don't, you know, like if, if writing novels is what you love, that's what you should pursue. And uh, spending all this time writing short stories is only going to make you frustrated. Um, now, I think short stories are amazing. I love short stories. I mean, I've basically devoted my life to short stories. So um, I would definitely encourage people to uh, read as many as they can to learn to love them if you don't already, because I mean, there's so many great writers that are writing short stories like today especially like there we're in such a golden age of short fiction uh including just short fiction that you can read online for free um so there's like zero investment uh, required to to experience all this stuff um so um so yeah i mean i but i mean i think so read as many short stories as you can and like i said you know there's lots and lots that you can read online for free um i mean i would uh pick up uh best of the year collections like you know best american science fiction and fantasy or there's a bunch of different ones there's uh, year's best fantasy and horror there's uh you know all, all these different ones um and um you know read those because then that's uh that's showcasing the best that were published over the course of a year. Um, and it's like, so in the case of like, as series editor, it's like, you know, I read like thousands of stories every year in an, in an effort to winnow it down to the, the top 80, who I then, I give it to the series, the guest editor, and then they pick the best 20 stories. But uh, so I read thousands of stories, so you don't have to, you only have to read, you only, you know, like, oh, I've done all the work to find here, here are these wonderful 20 stories <laughs> for you to read. Um, but uh, reading those uh, kinds of things or, and just reading widely in short stories will help inform you to how to how you would go about it. But then as far as actually uh, getting published, a lot of magazines have uh, open reading periods. Uh, some of them are just open all the time. Um, so you just look at their websites, look at um, look at their submission guidelines and see what what their guidelines say. Um, there's a lot of different um, market listings. There's like um, uh, there's one called the Submission Grinder. Uh, there's one called uh, Duotrope. Um, and then there's one that's like, it looks like it's uh, a very old website and, and it is, but it actually is uh, like currently maintained uh, called uh, Rallan.com, uh, R-A-L-A-N.com. Um, and it's very like uh, speculative fiction focused. And so, but like, he he just updates it all the time and like it, it, it's like the the website is 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 looking pretty old but the content is current um and that and you know so you can look there and see like oh well there's an anthology that's open or here's this magazine that just reopened after being closed for a while um and uh so so there's that kind of thing um and then uh and so that's what i would advise uh if like if you want to actually write for an anthology uh like say like you hear that like you know me or like Ellen Datlow or some some editor like you know that they're 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 they announced some anthology that they have coming out um and it's like oh I really want to write a, a story for for that book well you're probably not going to be able to write it for that book but if you want to write for them someday like in the case of like for somebody like me who has a magazine you know you could well, you know, try to sell me a story for the magazine. And if I then like you, I like your your stuff, um, then maybe I would invite you to write something for an anthology. Because anthologies are typically invitation only, uh, mm -hmm. just because, 
you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for it. Sorry, this has become a very big answer. It's fantastic. Um, this is exactly <laughs> the kind of specificity that I wanted from okay. someone who knows the business. I'm, yeah. I'm literally writing notes in the chat so people can keep up. It's fantastic. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, so uh, one of the one of the reasons uh, that you do invitation only print anthologies is because well, a uh, it makes it a huge project if you do open submissions because you could get a thousand submissions for a one book that's going to publish thirty stories. So it's like that's you know that's a lot. Um, but then also, um, if you do an open reading period and you have a thousand submissions. You're only going to take you're probably going to solicit a good number of them so uh the number of submissions that you can actually buy from the thousand is probably very small probably like only five or or so um and then um so then you have to reject you know 995 stories and guess what happens to those they flood the market so like say you do a very specific theme and you do this open submission period you reject all those stories you know, most of those stories won't sell, but a fair number of them will. They'll sell to all the different magazines that are in the in this space. And then the magazines will probably publish the stories before your anthology comes out. Because, you know, when you do an anthology, it's like the traditional publishing um, schedules are much longer than like just a magazine schedule because magazines are usually more um, very small business, sort of like one person runs it kind of deal. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so it's like, you know, you do this cool theme and you have this very specific idea and then it's like you reject all these stories and then like, oh, well, by the time your anthology comes out, everybody's gotten Everyone's sick of that. Bored of that theme. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's so interesting. And as secondhand summary, I said, that's something that I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a small caveat of the business that is so interesting that, that, you know, I had no idea about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So interesting. So just to just to recap that, because I, mm -hmm. I think it's very useful when we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, specific career sure. advice to do yeah, recaps. Yeah. If people are interested in short stories, first of all, they should write and read a lot of short stories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They should submit first to magazines mm -hmm. um, that they like. And they should also consider things like Submission Grinder, Raylan.com, Duotrope as places mm -hmm. to go and look for things, submissions that are open. Yeah. Um, and then hopefully they get solicited by a mm. John Joseph Adams or similar <laughs> to come yeah. and write short stories for an anthology. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah. And I mean, and if you do find an anthology that has open submissions, I mean, it's like there's no there's no reason not to try to submit to one of those. But uh, I, I guess I would also say... Um, consider pay rate, uh, like, you know, uh, there are a bunch of magazines and, and like sort of anthologies that might have an open call that, that you know, uh, are doing like one cent a word or something for, for, the, for the payment. And it's like, that, and that's fine if you wanna uh, sell a story to such a place, but uh, you should consider like, okay, well, I wanna start at the top and then like work my way down rather than going, like think, like don't devalue yourself and think like, oh, well, I'm just beginning. I should sell my stuff to a, a, a place that's, you know, paying a, a small amount, um, you know, it's like, uh, if it's a very specific theme, like, and you want to go for it, it's like, okay, we'll go for it, whatever. Like, you know, that if, if you're confident you're going to write more stories and publish more stories, then fine. But it's like, um, you know, I see, I see a lot of writers who make that mistake where they, um, they don't shoot for the stars. And it's like, well, maybe they could have sold that story to this like really top market, um, but they sold it to a little tiny one instead. So, so, you know, don't devalue yourself. Um, I guess the, just one other thing. Um, so anybody who's like really interested and serious about this and they really wanna like grow as a writer, uh, there are a lot of different writing workshops that you can uh, join. And like, so uh, speculative fiction is like sort of rich with these. And so like uh, the most notable one is the Clarion Writers Workshop. Um, and it's like this six week intensive boot camp sort of situation where like, you know, you go to the you go to the venue and like you stay there with like the 18 and other students. And then they have uh, six different instructors uh, over the course of the, the workshop. And they're all like professional writers. So like George R. R. Martin has been a teacher there, you know, like everybody, <laughs> everybody's been a teacher there, basically. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's rare that you have somebody like George uh, at there. But like they're always very notable writers who are like experts at their craft and they uh and they always only pick people who can actually teach you know like because not everybody knows how to or is good at it um so uh so those workshops are sort of legendary for um you know really like leveling up writers um like as an editor i've seen like people have these like quantum leaps going from like seeing their submissions before they go into clarion and then like seeing them after and like whoa like they they really like internalized 
those lessons and like really put them to use. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, I mean, it's, it's not cheap, you know, they are expensive workshops to attend, but I mean, they are really good if you can, um, if you can make it work for you and, and not everybody's going to need it or want it, but, but it, they are a thing. So there's Clarion, there's Clarion West, and then there's Odyssey. Those are sort of the, the, the big three. Um, although I actually, I also wrote an article about this at some point years ago. Uh, I was updating it every year for a while and then I stopped, but uh, the information is all still generally good where like, you know, you just need to look at the websites to see what their current stuff is. But uh, if you Google John Joseph Adams and writing workshop, you'll find it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, I've already seen a request for a blog post from World Anvil listing hmm. some of the short story magazines. Oh, yeah. So John, expect an yeah. email from me. Sure, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> there well, will tell, be a uh, follow up to this. Yeah, there will yeah, be yeah. a test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll say what one one quick way for that is like if you pick up something like Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy in the back, there's uh, there's the notable stories, which are the 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 rest of the top 80 that didn't make it into the book. So um, uh, and if you look at that list, it tells you where each story was published. And so it's like, OK, well, that's basically the top magazines, you know, like because it's like, OK, well, they published the best stuff that year. Um, and I mean, but yeah, I can I can definitely um, we can we can get something together for you. So. Yeah, absolutely. This is this is so helpful. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked short stories. Mm -hmm. What about novels? Right. Any advice for writers preparing novels for traditional publication or wanting right. to go that direction? Right. Uh, well, yeah. Um, so when you write a novel and you want to get it traditionally published, I mean, I think everybody should look for an agent first. So like you need to write the novel first and then you have to have it ready and then you have to write a query letter and you're gonna wanna like research that and like what all the different parameters for what it should go in a query letter, query letter should be and Just how to- Gonna remind the beans, we have done a stream on query letters oh, earlier okay. this year. So do go sure. and check that out. It should yeah, be yeah, on yeah. YouTube now. Right. Um, and so uh, so if you want to get an agent because because of the way traditional publishing works, it's just not really particularly viable to be able to sell novels without one. Um, I mean, there are examples where people have done that. And even as when I was editing my novel imprint, I did buy a couple um, novels from people who didn't have agents. But they were already people who were like in the industry who like I like, you know, in one case, Ashok Banker, like I had published some short stories of his. And then so I ended up or sorry, there uh, he uses they them pronouns now or they use. Uh, so they uh, it's confusing when you know a person before they use different pronouns, you know, uh, but I try, you know, it's, uh, um, but uh, they, uh, you know, I published uh, short stories by them and then ended up acquiring the novels. Um, and uh, and actually, yeah, it happened a couple times, really. But uh, but it's it's a it's a very rare case um, where that works. Um, and and if you don't know people already in the genre space, like it's not probably not going to work for you because not not a lot of publishers even will consider them. And so it would only be a case where um, like if you were if you were working in the field in some other capacity and thus you knew people, like you might be able to get somebody to look at a thing. And again, it would still be a pretty you know, pretty rare case where that would actually pan out. So agent is really the way you would want to go, um, which is, you know, not to say that like, if, you know, if, if, if indie publishing is, is something that you want to do, like there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's very viable these days. Um, but if you do want to go the traditional publishing route, like, yeah, probably an agent is what you want. Um, and then as far as how to find the right agent for you, uh, you're going to want to do a lot of research that, you know, uh, look in the books of people that you like uh, or, um, or or who have books that are like what the book that you wrote is. Um, and then like look in the acknowledgments and see, did the author thank their agent? That's the easy way to find out who is their agent. Um, because some, you know, sometimes it's just on their website, often it's not. So, but the acknowledgement page is a good place to look. And so you can just see like, oh, okay, well, this agent likes this kind of stuff. So maybe they would like my stuff. Of course, the downside is, well, they already have this author that does this kind of stuff. Maybe they have, maybe they got that covered already, but um, it's, a, it's a starting place. Um, but it also is like a way for you to sort of uh, uh, vet an agent by seeing like, who do they rep? You know, and agents are pretty good about listing who they rep on their websites. But in terms of like, what is it going to mean? What uh, what uh, person um, uh, adds value to you? Because you're like, oh, I really like this author's work. I trust them that they picked a good agent or whatever. You know, so um, which you know, not every not every author is a great business person, so it might not that might not be the best method. But it's it's just a starting place, you know. Um, and uh, there are a lot of great agents out there. There are a lot of agents out there that 
not so great. Um, so, I mean, I definitely, it definitely does pay to do your research and um, a good agent honestly will always pay for themselves. Like, you know, they're going to take 15% off of, you know, domestic stuff. And then like, it's a, like a higher percentage on, on, on international stuff, just because there's more, you know, people taking piece of the pie. Um, but, um, but, but a good agent, like, you know, they charge you 15%, but they're going to get you more than 15% than what you would have gotten offered if you had somehow gotten an offer without an agent. <laughs> but the, the, the fact is that they're going to know the marketplace. They're going to know who, which editor to send your book to at which house, because you can only send it to like, if you're going to try to publish a novel at tour, they have like 30 editors working there or something. And so it's like, you only get to send it to tour once though. So you have to know the right person to send it to that's going to give you the best chance. And a good agent knows that. Um, so, so yeah. So, so, so that's what I, that's what I would say. And then, um, I mean, the same same advice as for writing short stories goes. You know, like read widely in the field that you want to publish in. Um, I, I guess I would also say read widely outside the field too, if you can. Um, you know, read nonfiction about things that are, are relevant to what happens in your book. You know, so that you can be knowledgeable about it and, and it comes across as authentic. Um, and um, and yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, don't don't be afraid to to go outside your sort of comfort zone in terms of what you're reading because you might pick up different uh, different things, different tricks, different um, uh, sort of styles from from other books um, that that are that are not the sort of typical thing that you would read. Uh, so and you know you might you might find you might find it like a unique take by doing that. Um, I mean, there's any number of people who have sort of uh, fused two different genres or two different elements of genres together to make a, a new unique thing and then have gone on to great success. So um, yeah, so that's that's uh, it's a tried and true uh, method. So one more time, that is write yeah. a novel that you are happy <laughs> with. Try and find an agent to mm -hmm. do that you can search online you can look in books of authors that are comps right comparable mm -hmm. books yeah. to mm -hmm. try and find who their agents are mm -hmm. um what do you think of tools like query tracker are you are you sort of aware of these are these in your, in yeah. your space uh yeah i mean i'm aware of things like that uh i don't know enough about them to like sort of evaluate them on a like case by case basis because i haven't i haven't used them myself um but i mean like yeah they they are useful like i i have i mean i actually have used uh, some of them sometimes because just, um, I, I mean, I do actually have an agent myself because uh, when you sell an anthology, it's, you're kind of like an author in the, in, in the way publishing treats you because it's like, so I, I would take my anthology proposal out and my agent would sell it, you know, in the same way that he would sell a novel where it's like, you know, he's going to know the right person to send it to at whichever house. Um, and so, um, so I have used them in that case, but, uh, but it, I mostly relied on like, you know, just my industry knowledge to, to make my decision in that case. But um, so I don't, I know I haven't, I haven't tested those tools extensively, but, but they definitely, I, I do know that they are useful for people because they do have good information, but it's just a starting point. You still have to do research outside of that. And, you know, um, if you can, like, like because of social media uh, being so ubiquitous these days, it's like, it's a lot easier to sort of like, find somebody who is an author of one of the agents that you're looking at and just like look at their Twitter feed or whatever and see if they ever talk about their agent or whatever. And it's like, you know, if they're, if they express sort of uh, 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 vague rumbling frustrations about publishing, maybe that's not a great sign. It might, I mean, it might, you know, it's hard to say, you can't always blame your, their agent. Sometimes it's going to be their editor. Or sometimes it's going to be something else, but uh, you know, you might get some sense like if they're, if, I mean, a lot of people talk about how much they love their agent. And so like, if that's the case, then that's a good sign. But I, so, yeah. I like to think of the agent in the process as kind of like the guide plus translator. Mm -hmm. Like if you, I'm a big Star Trek fan. If you walk into the Klingon court, mm -hmm. you need some, you need a Klingon next to you. You need right. somebody who knows the other Klingons, who speaks right. Klingon, who mm -hmm. can get you a good deal from the Klingon <laughs> court right. and knows what a good deal looks like. That's mm -hmm. how I like mm -hmm. to think of agents because right. I'm a giant nerd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I like it. Um, how do you know that your agent is a good fit or that the publisher mm -hmm. is a good fit? Right. Uh, so yeah, an agent, um, I mean, you just, you have to have like a conversation and just like try to talk about like genre broadly and, and find out like how, like there, 
it, when you're first signing up with an agent, they're almost like, unless you're already established, they're going to like have read your book and they're going to have thoughts about what you can do to improve it. And when you have that conversation, um, you know, obviously you're gonna have to decide is what they're saying, does what they're saying make sense? Or does it seem like they're off base? Like, does it seem like they didn't really get this book? If you have any sense that they didn't really get your book, they're probably not the right agent for you because even if you revise it, however you revise it, they're maybe not going to really approach it from the right way. Um, like I, I know there was one uh, author I, uh, I know who she had had a meeting with an agent and he said something in the meeting that she just like, uh, responded to so viscerally she was like uh, she was like she 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 made a she, she like grabbed the edge of the table like she was gonna flip the table and and like he actually like he was like are you were you about to flip the table just now um, and I mean she wasn't actually gonna do it but it's like she definitely had the the instinct um, and so it's like okay well that's that's not a great sign um, trust but, your gut uh, yeah 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 um, and the funny thing is it's like that I I know both people in that case and it's like the agent's a great agent. It's just that they weren't a good fit. And and that's fine. You know, like not everybody's a great fit. I mean, like I've rejected stories that have won major awards and stuff. And I've gone back and looked at them again after they won the awards. And I'm like, I still don't like it. I, I don't get it, you know? And it's like, you know, just, well, it wasn't for me, you know? And I mean, I think that's an important lesson to remember <laughs> as well, just in general, um, that just because you get a rejection or something doesn't mean that there's anything particularly wrong with your story. I mean, maybe it does, but, um, you know, it, it's uh, just that that editor was not the right editor for you um, in that case. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, so that's how, uh, sorry, getting back on track here, but um, that, so that's how, you know, you sort of uh, suss out whether an agent's right for you, but then um, uh, an editor, it's, uh, it's kind of similar. Um, you know, you're, uh, you often will have that uh, editorial phone call where, you know, the, that's that's where you're really going to get the the real um, sort of feedback on on what is what does this person think that is wrong with your book that needs to be fixed or whatever, or uh, or, or how do they see it uh, fitting into the marketplace and that kind of thing. Um, and then you'll get a good vibe for, you know, does it seem like they really believe in this book? Does it seem like it's I'm going to get the 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 proper care that uh, uh, the book needs? And and uh, you know, because it's like uh, get it, selling your book to an editor is like a, a very like sort of intimate partnership. Um, you know, and uh, I mean, agent too, really. Like if you if you leave and if you have to break up with an agent, it really is like ending a marriage in a way because it's like you because you also have like shared custody of of properties afterward because oh, an agent. Right. Yeah, because an agent still um, is the agent of record on everything that they sold. So they still get their commission on all those books that maybe are in print and they're still selling. And then so you still have to have a relationship with them because, you know, they or their their company is going to be sending you checks still um, in perpetuity <laughs> until the books go out of print or whatever. Um, so, you, you know, it, it is kind of awkward in that way. But um so, uh, but, but for the editors, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's much in the same, um, you know, I've had some of these author calls where like I had to, um, you know, explain the different ways where I thought like, oh, well, hey, I think, well, this is what this book needs and that and all that kind of thing. But then sometimes it's just like going on and being like a big cheerleader and be like, you know, just really communicate your enthusiasm and excitement and convince them that you're the right editor because you're like, I'm the most passionate about this, you know, and uh, so uh, there's, you know that's that's another way that you can you know tell if, if an editor is the right one for you to like if you have like multiple people offering on your book which does happen um uh also often it's just like well who's offering me the most money that's the right editor for me you know um but uh you know i i did win at least one bid when we had a multi-book auction that we, like we didn't have the top bid but the author just felt more comfortable going with me because i mean it was close the bid so it, it wasn't like such a big deal but um you know, it, it's not like money, the, the top money always wins out. Sometimes it's like, you got to believe in the editor and, and the publisher and feel like they're really behind you. Um, sometimes like, you know, like I was, uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's, uh, you know, they, they were always, they weren't one of the big five, quote unquote, you know, they weren't so, the, but they were a very large publisher. And so they had, they had basically a lot of the resources of such a big publisher, but, uh, but it was smaller enough that like, um, if you're an author looking at it as considering as a publisher, it's like, okay, well, we, we have the resources of a big publisher, but uh, we're not as sprawling as one. So like yeah. when we have a book, we can actually, we can take 
more care and 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 put you more effort more into this attention yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, at least that was the idea. Um, amazing. So, yeah. Amazing. We have a question here from Shadon, who is clearly a fan. Hmm. Uh, they say, I loved it in Lightspeed when you introduced Women Destroy Science oh. Fiction mm -hmm. and subsequent others who destroy the traditional mm -hmm. ideas of what a genre is. Since mm -hmm. then, have you seen more access to alternative fiction? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they add, I have indigenous heritage, so that's my main oh. interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, those those uh special issues definitely like opened up a lot of doors to uh like you know making people feel comfortable submitting to you know science fiction magazines or, or science fiction fantasy magazines feeling like they were welcome in that space um and so like these days uh i feel like there's again it's like kind of like a golden age in that regard too like we're seeing more diverse more diversity and like contributors than we ever have before. Um, and of course, everybody's paying much more attention to it now, realizing that it was this inherent bias problem in publishing for forever. Um, and it's still there in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, and, and I think uh, most people are trying to be, uh, you know, cognizant of it these days. Um, but like, you know, I've still encountered it, um, you know, just sort of uh, as an editor talking to people trying to uh, in publishing, trying to get different projects greenlit and everything. And, and like, it's like, it's like some really uh, baffling sentiments uh, sent my way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, um, I think I think it's it's indigenous uh, authors are definitely something I, I feel like I, I would love to see more people, uh, you know, writing things uh, and submitting things because it's like there's uh, there's been a big push for uh, black authors and they uh, uh, so like there's a magazine called Faya. Uh, which it exclusively publishes science fiction fantasy by black authors. And so that's done a lot to uh, really develop um, writers in that space because, uh, you know, well, there's a whole magazine devoted just uh, for, for those folks. Um, but uh, yeah, indigenous people haven't had as much uh, opportunity like that. So um, I would love to see more submissions from, from indigenous writers. Um, and it is something I do pay attention to. Um, uh, so the uh, the next uh, edition of Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy that's coming out in uh, in November this year is is guest edited by Rebecca Roanhorse. So um, you know uh, I'm I'm hoping that um, you know one side benefit of of having her work on the book might be that more Indigenous people will um, will find it because she herself is Indigenous and and you know maybe they'll uh, be more inspired to to write science fiction and fantasy stuff or or else you know uh, feel like they're 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 contributions are welcome you know because i think that's that's just been the, the that was the horrible realization a lot of people in publishing came to you know you know sadly too recently uh is that you know the way the genre was sort of presenting itself and the stories that we were publishing and everything and the way we were going about things was making it so that it wasn't like it didn't feel like a safe space or a welcome space for a lot of different people um <clears throat> and that was a, a large part of what we were trying to you know, destroy with the destroy project, um, that, that sentiment. That. Um, but, uh, yeah. I think, I think that's so. awesome. Uh, we have another question on a similar bent. Uh, would being a non-native English speaker who writes in English be a disadvantage mm -hmm. in traditional publishing? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think so. If, uh, I mean, if, if you're writing in English and the English is, uh, you know, if it's done well, then I, I mean, I don't think it would be any disadvantage if there's like little infelicities that like that just need to be edited, that's fine. But I mean, if, um, you know, if you're a fluent speaker and you, and you write like a fluent speaker, then, uh, I mean, I think that that's totally fine. Um, if, if it's a case where it's like, um, it might need uh, more work because it's like the the language barrier. Then um, there might be a case where, like, uh, if if an editor sees the the obvious quality of a thing, um, uh, you know, they could potentially get uh, you know like a, a translator who can speak you know both languages that just do an editorial pass on it or something to polish it up. Like, it wouldn't necessarily need a translation, you know, because it's like it's already in English, but maybe something to polish it up. But I don't know. I, I'm just kind of trying to think of all the different ways that that might come up or be addressed but um uh yeah i mean i i, I mean i think in general just it's not it's not a problem because as long as as long as uh, the story is good and um and and the writing is uh you know already in english if, if it's just like a little bit of uh like 
oh, well, this is obviously like a, a thing that was lost in translation. Well, that's easy enough to fix, you know, and it's like, it's easy to spot those things too. Um, so, um, and I think, yeah. uh, you know, as, as we're, as we're um, interested in, in, you know, lifting up all of these underrepresented groups, we are also interested in, in bringing in the rest of the world into this conversation as well. So like, you know, I know there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, writers from all, uh, there's different countries that have like this, like sort of uh, population of, of people who are attempting to, you know, publish science fiction and fantasy stuff in English, uh, even though English is not their language there. Um, and and it, it's interesting how some countries it's like prevalent and some countries it's not, uh, but there's a lot of different uh, people uh, all over the world who are, who are doing this. And so, um, yeah, I don't think it's a particular disadvantage. Um, so. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah. I think, I think the big takeaway from that is if there are just a few issues mm -hmm. with like yeah. a couple of grammar things, yeah, well, yeah. do you know what? There are plenty of native English speakers who have terrible yeah. grammar. Yeah. It's fine. Some of it even slips into traditionally published books sometimes. Right. I've seen <laughs> it happen. It's okay. It's sure. fine. We don't yeah, love yeah. it, but do you know what? It happens. Yeah. Um, so I think in most cases, it wouldn't be an issue. Right. I mean, just to put it all out there, I honestly have to look up lay versus lie every time it comes up. Like I still, I have never internalized it. Um, mostly I try to edit it out. <laughs> it's like, okay, can we reword this so that we don't have to figure this out? Cause I don't, although I'm also not a copy editor. So I'm like, okay, look, right. I'll leave, let the copy editor do it. You know, <laughs> leave it to the specialist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a dyslexic, I have to say that I rely heavily on the spell checker. And yeah, yeah, yeah. there are days when not even the spell checker knows what I mean. So <laughs> do you yeah. know what? Right. I'm a native English speaker. Right. But speaking of world building and yes. publishing, let's mm -hmm. take a moment to talk about the Cobalt Guide to World Building. Tell me a little bit about how this wonderful book came to being. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I had been talking to the people at Cobalt Press about, uh, you know, doing some work for them because, uh, you know, I wanted to get involved in uh, tabletop stuff. And uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jeremiah Tolbert, he's their, he's their webmaster. And so um, so he sort of put in the good word for me and I uh, started talking to them. And so, uh, you know, they thought that this would be a good uh, first project for me since it's like, you know, we could do a we could sort of cross over. Uh, tabletop RPGs and uh, science fiction fantasy because world building, you know, applies to both just as well. And so in the book, it's kind of, um, it's kind of half people who are from the publishing world and half people who are from the tabletop world. <laughs> yes, I have so, it too. Yes. Um, oh, is. So uh, yeah, let me read yeah. out that list of names. Sure, so Gail sure. Simone is somebody who writes for um, big, big yeah. comic book writer, yeah. mega superhero writer. Yeah. Keith Baker, who wrote Eberron, Veronica mm -hmm. Roth, James Sutter, Ken Liu, Ashley Warren, Kate Elliott, Michael E. Shea, you may recognize some of these names, guys, mm -hmm. Tobias S. Buckle, Shanna Germain, Jeff Grubb, uh, Gabe Hicks, and the Dungeon Dudes, mm -hmm. and more. There are so many wonderful names in here. Um, and it takes you through creating pantheons, incorporating technology into your fantasy environments, designing a world. That's what we do, guys. Mm -hmm. Leaving space when world building so that the characters can bring it to life. So much good stuff in here, guys. Cannot cannot recommend it enough. Yeah. I've already it's mm. it's uh yeah, I've already read it. Oh nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was together. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun to put together. Uh, I mean, it was the first time I'd ever edited a, a, a nonfiction anthology. I'd always only done, you know, short story anthologies. Um, but uh, you know, world building is something that I've thought a lot about over the years, you know, because it's like, I mean, as uh, as an editor of, of short stories and novels, I mean, uh, it's like, it's a critical component. I mean, you know, a, a science fiction fantasy story, like if it doesn't have, if the world building doesn't all make sense, then it doesn't really work, you know? Um, so, you know, so yeah, but it was really interesting to, to, to work on and especially to, uh, to bring both of these worlds and both of these interests that are so near and dear into my heart together into one book. Um, and I hope, I hope that, uh, you know, people from publishing also find it and find good use out of it. And then, you know, vice versa. Um, and I think, uh, it was an interesting tightrope, type tightrope to walk to, 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 to find essays and topics that, uh, can mostly apply to both worlds. Um, you know, there's some of them that are obviously very explicitly, uh, focused towards tabletop stuff. Um, but then it's only a very few of them that I think that are, are very restricted in that way. And almost all of them, you know, otherwise, uh, aside from those few examples, uh, really can apply to both fiction and tabletop, uh, RPGs. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, but uh, it's a. I, I think I think there's a lot of like important things in here, like uh, like Coral Coral Alejandro Moore's uh, essay, um, "Weave Your World Thread by Thread." Um, Beautiful, yeah, yeah, which is a, a guide to diverse and inclusive world building. Um, I, I think topics like that are really important um, because I think uh, in in RPGs and in fiction, I mean, uh, there's there's still a lot of uh, sort of white uh, default that happens with yeah. characters um and and that's a that's a factor in um in that kind of underrepresentation we were talking about earlier Absolutely, that's that's yeah. part of the reason why uh people are or bipoc people and and you know of, of uh every stripe and 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 queer people and and things like that like they don't feel welcome uh writing in these spaces because they don't see themselves re reflected in these in in the stories or in the games and that's not as much of a problem as it used to be it used to be really terrible and like now it's getting a lot better but there's still a lot of work that can be done in that space uh i mean even if you just look at like a uh like just like a dnd module like just a watsi module if you like say you buy it on roll 20 or something like that it's like all the tokens that are in there almost all the tokens like are like look like a white people like i mean yeah. you know the elves look white the people the humans look white you know um there's there's all kinds of uh you know uh monstrous races and stuff that are different colors but all the all the humanoids are basically white uh and you know there's there's a few exceptions you know but but it's very you know noticeable um and uh so i mean that's one of the things that when i dm i i have gone to taking great efforts to make like uh, uh, you know, different NPC images that are, you know, more diverse so that I can, you know, mix it up because it was like when I was trying to pull things from that was just in the in an adventure or just that was in uh, like in the roll 20 search or whatever. It's like it was just like too much of it was like, okay, <laughs> just defaulting to white again here. Big white um, dudes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hot white chicks. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what D&D art often yeah. looks like. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's a shame. So, yeah. um, I've seen, yeah, I've seen a lot more representation and I'm really, really happy to see that. And I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've, we've yeah. just got to keep, got to keep moving forward on that. It's about mm -hmm. freaking time. Yeah. We've been humans for quite a long time. It's about yeah. freaking time we came to terms with that. Yeah. Um, so um, I am, yeah, I'm really, really glad to hear that you are, as I say, ringing that mm -hmm. bell and yeah. moving forward with that. Um, I would like to share very quickly Cobalt Press's latest release, which I think might be interesting for some of you guys. It is modular D&D com content focused on cities and towns. Now, this is D&D uh, 5e specific. It is uh, almost at a hundred thousand pounds, which means it must be, yes, $120,000. So if you back it, you're assured to get it. There's no... no um, uh, mm -hmm. How do I say? No chance here. So go and check it out. It looks really wonderful. And as always with Cobalt Press, it is of the highest quality from the best people in the industry. They <laughs> really know what they're doing. They they produce first class content. Um, and I should know because I'm one of their writers. No, no, <laughs> no, no. That's silly. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, they get some of the best beans in the industry and they, they create stunning art and, and just yeah, beautiful books like this. Mm -hmm. What can I say? Um, that is all we have time for today. So, John, thank you so much for coming to join us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. It was wonderful. And as I say, I will be hitting you up because I think there's a lot of knowledge here I would like to capture and um, yeah, turn into blog posts for these beans. They, there's, you've, dropped, <laughs> you've dropped a lot for us today. Thank you. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, happy to do it. Alrighty then, in that case, let me remind you, Beans, that tomorrow, yes, tomorrow, we are going live with a community stream where we'll be updating you on the latest in our community. We will be, of course, playing our drinking game. We will be answering your questions about world building, world anvil, rivers and waterways, and anything else you care to ask us, and generally having a good time. Uh, on Sunday, we are doing a rivers and waterways right along. So this is our first challenge right along where we will be doing writing sprints live where you can ask questions share your thoughts on rivers and waterways and write together with madeline one of our community leaders to uh yeah get your challenge entry sorted and next week make sure you come and join us for a stream on thursday on friday on saturday when we're going to be talking with the roll 20 experts and on sunday as well come join us for all of that and in the meantime 
A massive thank you to Second Ed Samurai, Rin the Win, ECC Books, Satrium, Neriax, Panther, Valby Gem, Stiltis, Undone Alex, and Alex Hendy. I hope you're not the same person, Undone Alex Hendy. And uh, finally, I would like you to pull out your biggest hammers and light up the forge as we go see Penny Dragon Games for our raid. Shout out in the chat, light up the forge with every flaming anvil you've got for our raid. Let us know that we sent you. One more massive thank you. And I would like to invite you to grab your hammer and go world build. Hmm. See you soon, Beans. Bye.